But no, today we're starting a brand new series uh, called Heroes, and we're going to be talking about a, a guy in the Bible, one of my favorite people in the Bible, a guy named David. Who in here likes David? David in the Bible. David is one of my favorite people in the Bible. One of the cool things about the Bible and about God's Word is that, is that with the people in it, God didn't hide stuff. He didn't just take the good and make everybody look good. He, he took the ugly, the bad, the nasty, the stuff that, that would be like on tabloids, you know, when you walk in. That's, a, that's exactly, that's ex there are places where it would have been blowing up on Facebook and, and on National Enquirer, all those different things. And, and God does not exclude that. That's what's cool. In the life of David, we'll look at some of that where God did not exclude all of those things. But God included those for what? For us to learn you know, you can learn by people's successes, and you can learn by people's mistakes. And so God includes those for us. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, an amazing verse, an amazing verse about David. It says, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, the son of Jesse. Look at this. A man after my own heart. He will do everything that I want him to do. Who would like that to be what God thinks about us? I found, I found Tom. I found Seth. I found Judy. A, a man, a woman after my own heart. How beautiful is that? That that can be our testimony. And, and if we want that, I think most of us would want that. For God to look at us and say, I don't think we want God to look at us and say, man, what a selfish jerk. No, I would not want that. I would want God to look at us and say, man, there's a person after my heart, a person that, what, keep going, a person that will do everything I want him to do. But that doesn't come naturally, and it doesn't necessarily come easily that we become that type of person. But, but David shows us how we do that. David shows us how we go about that. The thing with David is, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down, God saw things in David that others did not notice. God saw things in David that others did not notice. Uh, you know, if you look and you study this story out, and, and the first mention of David, we'll go ahead and look there in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. What had happened was Saul, who was the king at that time, uh, God had said, no longer going to, be, going to be the king. He is no longer going to be the king. We're going to find a new and a different king. And so here's what happened. God spoke to Samuel, who was the prophet, and said, I want you to go, uh, and I want you to find the, in the house of Jesse, and I want you to go, one of his sons is going to be king. He said, go to that. How many, how many like specific instruction from the Lord? <laughs> like, hey, just go that direction. I like it when God says, go to this direction, and then talk to this person. God said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, and one of his sons are going to be king. Okay, here's something kind of cool. How many know that God could have added one sentence in that whole process to make that even better? He could have said, he could have said this. He said, you could, I want you to go to the house of, of, of Jesse, and then his youngest son, David, is going to be the king that you choose. God did not do that, did he? God did not say specifically who is it going to be. Why? Because he wanted to teach Samuel and us some important lessons from that process. So what happens? He goes, Samuel goes to, to Jesse's house, and the first one who walks out to see him is the oldest son, Eliab, and he, he looks at him, and he's like, as soon as he sees him, he's like, bam, that's the one. This was like, here's what it was. This was like a, a private modeling session. It was like they had a runway where, you know, where Jesse was sitting there and Samuel was sitting there. And it was a private way, if you look at it historically. And he was sitting there and one by one the sons would walk in. The first son walks in, Eliab walks in. And he walks in and the first thing is he's thinking, man, that's him because why? He is big, he's strong, he looks like a leader. Here's the problem. Uh, if you looked at Saul, he looked like he was bigger than everybody else. He looked like a, a, a giant killer, even though he never did kill the giant. And, and what happened was... He went by the outward appearance. Look what happens in verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. That word rejected him doesn't mean I, I, have, I have pushed him away. It just means he is not the one. He is not the one that I've called to do this. It says, The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by what? Outward appearance. I mean, that's true in our culture, our society. It was true back then. You see someone, you're like, oh, they'd be perfect for that job. And they stink at that job. Oh, they'd be great for this. And they stink at that. And how many times do we judge people by outward appearance? But what does the Bible say? It says, but the Lord looks 
at the heart. See, God saw something that Samuel, the prophet, did not see. And even that Jesse, the father, did not see. How do we know that? Well, go, go on down. Look in verse 11 and 12. It says, then Samuel said, after all the sons had walked in front of him, after they had the modeling session for all the sons, and every one of them, the Spirit of the Lord said, not the one, not the one, not the one, not the one, not the one. At the end of that, I imagine Samuel was getting frustrated, and he says, are these all the sons that you have? There, there is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. He did not even send for him. The the prophet Samuel said, bring all your sons to me. Let's take a look at all your sons. And Jesse, the dad, did not even send for the youngest son. Why? Because the youngest son did not meet or fit the qualifications that he thought were going to be there for what Samuel was looking for. How many of you are happy about that? Because most of us don't fit. <laughs> Most of us don't have enough. We're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not this enough, that enough, or anything enough. And if you think you're anything enough, you've got a pride issue. Well, I'm, I can do this. I can do this. If God ever calls you to do anything and you think you can do it, you can't do it. And if you can do it, you're either thinking too small or you're full of pride. Anybody out there? So you're looking at this. He says, well, there's one son, but he's out there. and He's watching the sheep and the goats. And, and he said, send for him at once, Samuel said. And he did not sit down to eat until he arrived. He was like, I'm, I'm waiting for this one. I am waiting for this one. The Spirit of the Lord sent me all the way out here to find one of your sons. And this one, he didn't sit down. He didn't eat until he arrived. So Jesse sent for him. And listen to this. It says, he was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. He was a hottie. Wasn't very, wasn't very big, but this is what we see about him. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. His own father, his own dad, did not call him to that meeting. Here's the deal. God sees things that we don't see. God picks and calls people that we would not pick and call. There have been times where, where the Lord has spoken to me and said, that person's supposed to be it. I'm like, Lord, there are 10 people that I would pick before them. And the Lord said, you'd pick the 10 wrong ones. <laughs> Here's the deal. God sees different than we see. Some of you in this room, you don't... I want, I want to grab your, everybody just grab your attention real quick. Some of you in this room, you don't feel qualified. You don't feel good enough. You don't feel... You, I don't have enough education. I don't have enough this. I don't have enough that. It's not about this. It's not about this. It's about this. Amen. Right. Amen. Everybody get that? It's not about your looks. It, it's not about your stature. It's not about how much money or how much education you have. I was thinking about this. I mean, just uh, I had a meeting with a gentleman this week, a guy uh, who is one of the greatest outreach evangelists I've ever met in my life. This dude is impacting the city, the nation, the world. And I had a meeting with this guy today, and the dude is just rough. I mean, he is just rough. I mean, you do not want to get in a fight with him. He loves Jesus, but he would still whip your tail. <laughs> and I was meeting with this guy, and the guy has an eighth grade education. He stopped school after eighth grade, and this dude is making a greater impact than people who have masters and doctorates in theology. Hallelujah. And I'm sitting there going, would I rather have a, a paper on my wall, or I'd rather be changing the world? <laughs> Because there are dudes who have papers on their wall that God says, I'm not using them. I'm going to use that eighth grade flunky who, yeah. who's, who, who has still junk in his life. Every one of, who, who's not, he's not smooth and polished, but he's got a heart. Yeah. He's got a heart. That's what God looks at. God looks at this, and that's what changes. Here's the deal. How, how did David get that way? He got that way in private because here's, here, who you are in private is who you are. Who you are in private is who you are. Your heart shows more of you uh, and who you are than your outward appearance. And God saw something in David that others did not see. How did God see something in David that others did not see? Because God saw who David was in private. God saw who David was when he was watching sheep and goats. You ever watch sheep and goats? Not a fun job. They are dumb animals. And that was his job to watch sheep and to watch goats. And that's what he did. And he was faithful in doing that. In the middle of doing that, what had happened? He, no one else saw. Everybody listen to this. No one else saw what he was doing. But the God, the Holy God, saw what he was doing every step of the way. 
as a, a goat and a sheep started to get out of line, what did he do? He went and he got it and he took care of him. What did God see? God saw a lot of things in this young man that no one else saw because God saw what he did in private. Some of you are just fear, you're fearful because you do stupid stuff in private. Stop that and let the Holy Spirit deal with you because who you are in private is who you are. I want to be a person after God's heart in front of everybody and when nobody sees. Lord, help us with that one. What does God see in us that we sometimes and that others miss? Do you know God sees things in us that we don't even see? But if we would get close to his heart, he would start to show them. He would start to reveal. There have been times the pastor... I remember, especially as a youth pastor, this would happen a lot, where I, I would see kids, and they were going totally the wrong direction, and I'd walk by them, and as I walked by them, the Lord would say, I've got a great plan for that young man or that young lady, and I'm like, they're doing stupid stuff. And the Lord said, see beyond their stupid stuff and see their hearts. And I remember stopping, and I, I grabbed one of them, and I was like, man, God's got amazing stuff for you. I can see it in you. How do you see it in me? I'm just stupid right now. You are stupid. You're going to grow out of stupid. And hopefully... Because God's got a plan for you, and he's got a heart in you that will do amazing things. Let's look at some of the attributes of a, of a young David, someone attributes of someone after God's heart. Here's the first attribute we see in David. It's that David was a servant. David was a servant. He was a servant. He just served. That's what he did. That's what his heart was. His heart was to serve. His heart was to serve. The first place we see David, where's the first place we see David? We see David in a field. What's he doing? He's watching sheep and he's watching goats. He's serving. He's, he's just serving. He's just serving. He didn't have to have the limelight. He was just there to serve. He was there to serve. And here's what I would say to you. If you have the heart of a servant, God will use that heart and God will elevate that heart. Amen. God will take someone who has less talent, who has the heart of a servant, than someone who has incredible talent, who, who it's all about them. God looks for people who will be servants and who will serve. And first place we see David is we see David in the field serving Watching the sheep and watching the goats. Look at this in, in verse 16, chapter 16, verse 21 through 23. It says, so David went to Saul and began doing what? Serving him. David went to Saul and began serving Saul. Now think about this. Just a few verses before, David is standing before the, the top prophet in the, in the nation, Samuel, who is anointing him with oil. I mean, it's a, it's a big special ceremony because Samuel was a big deal. And he shows up at the house. Matter of fact, when he showed up to the town, everybody in the town got scared. They're like, what are you going to do here? And he goes, I'm just here to offer a sacrifice. I'm here to offer a sacrifice. I want the house of Jesse. It was a big deal when Samuel walked into town. So for Samuel to walk into town and for Samuel to call David in and David's dad, David's family, all of his brothers to see what happened, it was a big deal for him to do this. He got anointed by Samuel. And then what do we see him doing right after he got anointed by Samuel? He wasn't walking around saying, I'm the man, I'm the man. Bow to me, sir. No, what did he do? The first thing he did in response to this was he went to Saul, who was still the king, and he did what? He served Saul. It says, so David went to Saul and began serving him. I'm going to say this to you. If you don't have a heart to serve, you'll never have a heart that will do anything for God. Never will. Never will. If you don't have a heart that says, you know what, it's not about my title, it's about me serving others. Because serving shows where your heart is. What was Jesus' heart? I came not to, to be served, but to serve. Who wants a heart like Jesus? Then we've got to have a heart of a servant. Well, what does that look like? Serving. It means helping people. It means whatever God places in front of you. And sometimes there are things that aren't even in front of you that you've got to go out of your way to do. It's called serving. It says, the, so David went to Saul and began serving him. And Saul loved David very much. And David became his armor bearer. What does that mean? David had Saul's back. David was going to be the next king and David was faithful and he was loyal and he served Saul. If you look at the character of David after he was anointed king, he was anointed, he was anointed, big deal anointing, and then he goes and serves the guy that he's going to take his place. That shows some character. And he served him with his whole heart. 
Go ahead and keep going. It says, it says, it says then Saul said to Jesse, asking, please let David remain in my service. Serve me, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever a tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, it says David would play the harp, and then Saul would feel better. David would play and drive the demons away, and Saul would feel better, and the spirit would go away. Now, if you look at all this, David's heart to serve, David's heart to serve came before he was chosen by God and anointed by God and after. It did not stop. Once he was anointed to a certain position, he, he no longer quit being a servant. He stayed being a servant. And that's a great example for us. Amen. Never get so big that you don't serve. Yeah. Never be all that that you can't pick up trash in the parking lot. Anybody out there? If I ever get to some place where, where I don't pick up trash, you need to get a new pastor. Now, not all the time, but if there's trash in the parking lot and I walk by it and I'm too big to pick it up, that's an issue. Anybody got that? Yeah. Who wants a heart after God's heart? Yeah. Be a servant. Here's another thing we see that David was. David was a servant. David was a worshiper. <laughs> David was a worshiper. That's, he worshiped God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18, and it says, And one of the servants said to Saul, One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented heart player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war. He has good judgment. And he is a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. That's some good stuff to say about somebody. If you look at the first part of what it says, it says he is a, a talented heart player. It literally means he is a, an anointed heart player. He was so anointed in worship that when, when Saul would be troubled by a spirit, what would David do? David would play, and the spirit would be driven out during that time of worship. Who has ever been in that place where you have a spirit that bugs you? Who has worry? That's a demon spirit. Who has, I mean, who has fear? Who has doubt? Who has unbelief? Who has all these different things? What did David do in that moment? David worshipped. And what happened in the presence of God that was driven out? If we want to have a heart like David's, we have to have a heart to worship. Now, let me say that. If the only time you worship is on Sunday morning when calling the band are on stage, you are not a worshiper. You are attending a concert. That's what it is in your brain. You're attending a concert. Well, I don't like this song, so I'm not gonna, then you're not a worshiper. doesn't matter if you like the song. does not matter if you like the song. doesn't matter if you like the song. I remember when I first got saved, and, and uh, man, like one month after I got saved, I started preaching. And so I'd go to churches that would have me, which weren't very many churches that would have me. But the ones that would have me were usually way out in the country, and they were usually very small. And they usually weren't full of white people. It's true. White people wouldn't have me come preach. The people that have me come preach, I would go to, to black African-American churches. They would have me. They would teach me to sway because I had no rhythm. And, and then I would go to Native American churches, and they would teach me to eat the food they had. And it was awesome. And, and they would have songs and services that would last all day long. But the music they did was not music that I was used to. And I remember one time I'm in a service in this small little church. I'm getting ready to preach, and they're doing these old I mean, they're doing these old country songs, and I'm just like, I don't like old country songs. And I'm, I'm on the front row, I'm getting ready to go preach, and I'm just complaining to the Lord, this is horrible, this is horrible. That lady should not be singing. I sing better than her, and that's bad. And, and that guitar player, he is hideous. And What is this song? What is this song? They made this song. I mean, and, and I, I, I'm sitting there, and I'm complaining the whole time, and the Spirit of the Lord says to me, why don't you just shut up and worship? Why don't you just quit complaining about what you don't like, and why don't you love on me? And I'm like, well, could you help them sing better? He's like, won't you shut up? <laughs> Quit complaining about what you don't like and just start to worship me. And I remember there in the middle of country western, I mean, it was just were playing. It was horrible. And, and I remember standing there in the front row just worshiping God with all my heart. Hated every song they sang, just naturally. But I'm like, God, I'm going to worship you with everything that's in me. Amen. Anybody out there? Yeah. And you know what happened in that moment? The Spirit of God just came and blessed me and filled my heart. And he taught me a lesson. I don't have to like everything, but I should be a worshiper. Yeah. Everywhere I go and in everything I do. And that's what David did. Where did David learn to worship? He didn't learn to worship in the temple. Where did David learn to worship? David learned to worship sitting out watching sheep. He was out there watching sheep worshiping the Lord. He was out there watch, watching sheep writing songs of worship and praise to the Lord. But here's the deal. Sunday morning should be like this explosion of worship from a bunch of worshipers. Because how many of you said you wanted a heart after God's heart? You wanted God to look at you and say, man, I like, who wants that? Not as many now. Why? You don't want to work? Here. Well, you already talked about being a servant. You already talked about worshiping. I don't know. I, 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 I. 
If we want to heart after God's heart, we walk in this place. It rocks like crazy, not because the band is doing a great job. We believe they're going to do a great job, but even if they're not doing a great job, which they better, they'll be in trouble. But even if they're not, even if they're not, worship fills this place, not because the band, but because of the people. Does that make sense? Because if all of us walk in here with the heart of a worshiper, this place is going to, it's going to rock and change the world. And people who don't know Jesus will walk in, and you know what they'll do? They'll be like, man, something's going on in here. This feels different. This feels like something I'm missing. See, the church has gotten into being a show, and I've been to churches where everyone stands there and they just look at the screen and they don't worship. That is not worship. Man, worship is giving God our best, and, and we make it a show because we're afraid people who don't know Jesus will, will be freaked out. Here's what people who don't know Jesus will be. They'll be like, I came to church because I am empty and missing something, and all I'm watching is a show. I remember going to a church, and these people were worshipers, and I walked in, and they were jumping around, dancing. And I'm like, this is crazy and awesome at the same time. And I felt the spirit of the God in that place. And I, I'd been to church before, not very often, but I hadn't felt the spirit of God. When I felt the spirit of God, I was like, this is kind of different. But I need it. But I need it. And it touched and changed me. If we want to have a heart, if we want to have a heart after God's heart, we have to be worshipers. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1. David wrote this, O Lord, our Lord. Mm. Oh, Lord, our Lord. See, it makes it personal. <laughs> How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all of your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O oh, Most High. Here's the deal. Worship changes our perspective. Do you know most of the time when you study it, when David wrote a psalm or a song of worship, do you know most of the time it was not in a good time in his life? There are times where he wrote songs of worship where, where Saul was chasing him down to kill him, where his son Absalom, who had made a decision he was going to kill him, the dude was running for his life all the time and all the time. Out of those trials, out of those trials would not come Facebook posts of negativity or, or murmuring or complaining to the Lord about everything. What would come out of those trials were songs of worship. I just don't feel like worshiping. You don't understand what I'm going through right now. I understand probably not being chased down by your own son to kill you. Hopefully not. Yet still in the midst of that, what made his heart after God's heart was he worshipped. He worshipped. And we see this from a very young age. He was a worshiper. He gave it all to God. Worship changes our perspective and shows us how great and how wonderful that God is. Here's another thing. Worship keeps our heart sensitive and soft to God's heart. If we want to have a heart, if we want to be a person after God's heart, we have to be a worshiper. Here's the last one. David was a warrior. David was a warrior. Look at verse 18. It says that, it says in chapter 16, verse 18, it says that David was a brave warrior, a man of war. Amen. The dude fought. He was, he was full of courage. Chapter 17, verses 34 through 37, it says David, and David persisted as he's getting ready. Here's the deal. The children of Israel are, are faced with the giant Goliath. No one wants to come out and fight him. Everyone's afraid of fighting him. David's older brothers, who, if you looked at him, you're like, they are great warriors. If you looked at him, no one wants to fight him. Saul, who, who was heads above everyone else, the king, even though his country and his God were being disgraced, would not go out and fight. Then all of a sudden, this shepherd boy shows up with some food and says, David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I will go after it with what? A club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turns on me, I will catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Peter would have hated him. It <laughs> says, I have done this. I have done this to both lions and bears. He killed lions and bears with a club. And he's a boy. He's a warrior. He's a warrior. It says, I've done this to both lions and bears. 
And I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine too. For, for he has de defied the armies of the living God. And the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Here's the deal. Who was David a warrior for? He was a warrior to protect what God had entrusted to him. He wasn't just going out picking fights all the time, was he? He was a warrior to what God had entrusted to him. He was a warrior with the, to the sheep and to keep his, his lambs and everything safe that had been entrusted to him. That's a good thing to be a warrior to. And then he was a warrior for the army of God. He said, this Philistine has defiled and got, come against the name of, the, of God. And what did he do? He said, it is time for a fight. If you want to have a heart for God, there has to be some warrior inside of you. There's got to be some fight inside of you. Everybody get this. Part of the heart of God is to defend what God says. Now, listen to me. We fight in such a different way now than he did then. Don't go out with the club and start beating people in your neighborhood. Okay? Everybody get this. And people are freaking out over this whole... Okay, I'm just going to get political for a second. Everybody look up here. People freak out over this whole Target thing. I'm just freaking out. I'm freaking out over this whole Target thing because I don't like it necessarily. They're going to let someone in the same bathroom, but I'm just going to love people. How am I going to fight? I'm going to fight by loving people. Now, what did Jesus do? Jesus fought by loving people. Jesus went to the woman caught in adultery, and what did he do? He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, our warrior mentality has to be different. And many Christians, we act like that church in Kansas, and we'll pick it, and we'll gripe, and we'll complain, and all that does is push people farther away from Christ. Amen. Everybody get that? Amen. I was listening to a speech my son gave. One of my sons, he gave a speech this week. What was the quote he said? He said, he said people say to, uh, to love... Love the sinner and hate the sin. He said, you know, people say this all the time. Love the sinner and hate the sin. And he made this statement. I was like, that's pretty good. He's, he made this statement. He goes, the Bible doesn't say love the sinner and hate their sin. The Bible says to love the sinner and hate your sin. Yeah, he stole it. it was, he, he stole the quote, but it was good. And I was just like, man, that's, that is so true. How can I be a warrior? I can be a warrior by loving those who aren't loved. I can be a warrior by getting on my face and praying. I can be a warrior by standing up for righteousness with love as a part of that bond. Everybody get this. See, a warrior, it looks different today than it looked then. But it doesn't mean we sit on our rear and do nothing. We go and we love. We go and we love. We go and we build relationships. We go and see the light of Jesus shine through us over and over and over again. We go and we're intentional. You know what we did? We just went out and bought two war vehicles this week. Yeah, hallelujah. We just went, we went out and bought two war vehicles this week. We bought a bus, war vehicle. What are we going to do? We're going to go and we're going to bring people in and see the lives forever change. We brought a sidewalk Sunday school truck. We're taking it to the enemy's camp and we're kicking some tail in the enemy's camp. And we're going to need people who will sign up to serve to drive that. We're going to need people who will sign up, who will go be a part of those teams that go and we hand out food and we do services. And what are we going to do? I'm going to be a warrior, but I'm not carrying a club. I'm carrying a sword. See, when we grab a hold of that and we go into our community, into our culture, into our world, and we're carrying a sword, it's going to make a difference. Warriors never sit on their butt to get anything accomplished. Warriors go into battle. Anybody with me? Yeah. Who wants this heart like, like David had this heart? Here's the deal. You think about this. You think about David facing Goliath. It looked like an impossibility. When What we see as an impossibility, God sees as an opportunity. What we see as an impossibility, God sees as an opportunity. And God is looking for warriors today. How can you be a warrior? You can be a warrior by praying. You can be a warrior by serving. You can be a warrior by giving. You can be a warrior by just... Carry and making a difference in this world. Heart of David, what was he? He was a servant. The dude served. He was a worshiper. He was a warrior. That's what God's calling us to be today. I was thinking about this this week and I was meditating on that verse about Acts chapter 13, verse 22. It says, And I have found David. What does it mean? It means he was looking for him. I have found David, son of Jesse. A man after my own heart. And he will do everything I want him to do. Then I, I started thinking about when Jesus, when Jesus was in the garden praying, as he knew he was going to lay down his life on the cross, and he was in the garden praying, and he made this incredible statement. He said, not my will, but your will. 
you know, those two are tied together. You will see so many parallels between the life of David and the life of Jesus. And if we live a life like that, God, not my will. God, not what I want. We will live a life with a heart that says, God, whatever you desire, that's what I'm going to do. And when we have a heart like that, everybody look at me real quick. When we have a heart like that, God will pass over thousands to get to a heart like that. God will go past those who are more qualified to get to hearts and to say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And you're like, well, I could be uncomfortable. You're going to be. I could be unqualified. You're going to be. Because God specializes in taking unqualified people and changing the world. <clears throat> As long as that unqualified person says, God, whatever you want, that is what I will do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, that you are so good. God, I ask we would have hearts like David. Lord, we'll look at later on, even when he messed up, man, he repented. He had a heart that just wanted you. God, let our hearts be like that. Let our hearts be, God, whatever you say, that's what I'll do. Not my will, not my wants, not my desires, not, not me. Not me, but you. I pray that for each one of our hearts today. Not me, but you. How many of you are open to that prayer right now? You say, God, not me, but you. If that's you, lift up your hand. I'll pray for you. God, you see a bunch of hands in this room. Not me, but you. Not me, but you. Mess with us. Not me, but you. Show us what you want us to do. Mess with us. Whether anybody else sees it as little or big, doesn't really matter. We're not. We're here for an audience of one. Not me, but you. And God, we ask you to guide us. We ask you to lead us. We ask you to show us that we would live a life of not me, but you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.